Hello and welcome back to BioClass Bites. In this video, we are going to talk about unifying themes in the study of biology. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and like and share this video. These are the unit and lesson titles for this playlist, but in this video, we are going to focus on unifying themes in the study of life. Before we continue, I recommend that you watch this video from Study Biology entitled Importance of Biology. Uh, this video will hopefully um, help you realize the importance of this field of study and why we need to have more biology majors, especially now in this day and age. I'll provide the link in the description below. So number one, characteristics of life. All biology students must know that there are certain criteria that separates living things from non-living things. Why? Because life is very difficult to define. It might seem um, it might seem like a trivial question, a trivial matter, but actually if you go into it, into the smallest details, it's actually quite difficult to, to define life. So scientists and biologists have come up with criteria that differentiates living things uh, from non-living things. So those include um, having levels of organization, that, that all living things must have the ability to adapt to their environment and evolve. Um, over generations that most living things have the ability to respond to their to respond to their environment that since um, life without reproduction is impossible all living things must have the ability to reproduce um, all living things must have the ability to grow to undergo uh, uh, changes and to develop um, and all living things uh, must uh, are involved in energy processing whether it's harnessing energy from the sun uh, the way plants and algae do or processing um, processing food to 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 har harvest energy the way um, animals do and of course all living things are capable of maintaining homeostasis in their body through metabolic processes that regulates their uh, body functions number two um, another characteristic of life um, is having levels of organization. So, a characteristic of life is a high degree of order and biological organization is based on structural levels. And it is important for scientists to identify the dif different levels um, or structural levels so that they will have uh, more focus into what they're studying. So, what does it mean? So, um, so the first one would be, um, the first level of organization would be atoms and molecules. So those are the smallest levels. So we know that atoms um, is the uh, basic unit of matter and molecules are, are atoms that have uh, shared bonds. And then these molecules and atoms could, are actually found in organelles. And organelles are the are, are small organ organ like structures found within cells so they perform certain structure certain function within that cell so examples of organelles are your mitochondrion chloroplast nucleus so all of those organelles are found inside cells and in order for um for an, a specimen or an organism to be considered a living thing it must be made up of cells because all living things are made up of cells anything lower than cells questionable so cells are considered as the basic structural unit of life and if you put cells together or se several cells um, aggregate of cells work together to achieve a certain function so now we call that tissues so that's the next level so you go higher so tissues can form eventually form organs okay so t um, um, muscle tissues can eventually form uh, muscles or brain tissues can form the organ brain and organs can eventually form organ systems. Okay? For example, your digestive system is an organ system made up of organs such as your esophagus, your stomach, small large intestine, rectum, um, uh, pancreas, gallbladder, and liver. So those are different organs and they have a similar function, so they form organ systems. And eventually, organ systems can build up uh, uh, an organism. So this is an individual, it's counted as one, an individual organism. So you and I, we are an organism because we have organs and organ systems and so on and so forth. Now, organisms uh, um, that live together in a certain area or certain habitat, organisms of the same species um, that live together are called population. So they have to be, it to be considered of the same population, they, they have to be of the same species, okay? We have a lot of definition of the word species, but the most common one is that a species, always in plural, 
A species is a group of organisms that are so closely related that they could interbreed and produce fertile offsprings. Okay? So, organisms of the same kind, organisms of the same species that live in um, uh, a designated area is called a population. Now, so, for example, here we have here this tree. So, um, several, uh, several trees of the same species, that's their population. But if those um, population interact with populations of other species, okay, so for example, population of tree, okay, you have popula a species of um, uh, deer here, and then plant, um, anim, um, ants, and insects. So that becomes a community. So a community is a group of organisms belonging to different species that live together in an area. And if those, so these are all, all made up of living things. But if those living things start to interact with their physical environment, um, so with, from the living things, the biotic um, aspect, the biotic factor interacts with their physical environment, we call that an ecosystem or ecological system. So this one, uh, for example, this forest or this lake is an ecosystem because you have here the living things interacting with water, with soil, so those are non-living things, with air around them, so it's called an ecosystem. And all the ecosystems in the world make up the biosphere or that region of the earth that's capable of supplying life. So these are the different levels of organization, and at each, each level, um, scientists or, and biologists focus on studying the organisms. So for example, we have we have biologists who who um, who focuses on cells, so they are called um, cell biologists. Okay, so we have cells, uh, we have biologists or scientists that, that focuses on the human body. So those could be doctors or medical practitioners, or they could be um, um, physiologists. Okay, or we have organ, we have uh, biologists that focus on community and population. So they could be ecologists. They could be um, animal experts, they could be herpetologists, or they could be ichthyologists. So they have focus on those um, level. Or we have ecologists, I've mentioned this a while ago, and we have earth system scientists that focus on the entire biosphere. So different levels of organization are important, um, uh, important way for biologists to classify living things so that they could focus better um, on what they're studying. The third unifying theme in biology is this, uh, this, a statement from the cell theory that cells are the basic unit of life. So all organisms are made up of cells. In order to be considered a living thing, you must be made up of cells. Uh, cells are the lowest uh, level of structure capable of performing all activities of life. So this shows us uh, the different types of cells. So you have here a bacterial cell, then you have here your uh, prokaryotic ancestor um, of uh, eukaryotic cells, and then we have here the modern eukaryotic cell. Okay, so um, when we go to, when you go to uh, that uh, to the lesson on animal and plant cells, you will discuss the differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes um, uh, in in a in depth manner. So most multicellular organisms have cells. So humans are multicellular organisms, and some cells have specialized functions. Okay. So um, our multicellular organisms' development and survival are based on the functions um, and interactions of the cells within our body. And the cells, uh, the cellular basis of life is a theme that we will continuously encounter in this field of study in biology. So um, cells are the basic unit of life. So the, the cells are the basic components of your body. Your body is made up of trillions and trillions of cells okay? and all animals and plants are the same in that aspect. The next unifying theme is cycling of nutrients. So organisms interact with their environment that includes other organisms, okay, other species, other, other um, members of their community, as well as the physical component of their ecosystem. Okay? Those are um, abiotic factors. So organisms in an ecosystem um, are involved in two major processes, nutrient cycling and energy flow. So nutrient cycling is best exhibited by a biogeochemical cycles. Okay, we've tackled that already in the previous unit. So those would include um, interaction of biosphere with other spheres, atmosphere, lithosphere, and 
hydrosphere and those are best seen in biogeochemical cycles such as carbon cycle, water cycle, uh, phosphorus cycle, and nitrogen cycle. So in this um, illustration, we see um, living organisms or biosphere interacting with their physical environment, for example, plants. Uh, leaves of plants are absorbing being energy coming from the sun. And sometimes, you know, leaves would fall to the ground and they are eventually decomposed um, by organisms, okay, in order to recycle the materials and return them to the soil. Now, plants, on the other hand, um, also take up water and minerals uh, from the soil, okay, through its roots to be used for its um, uh, life processes. Okay, so um, other um, biogeochemical cycles, we've also already talked about that in the previous unit. Now, another thing that organisms are involved in ecosystems would be um, energy flow. Okay? So energy flow shows us um, how energy is converted from one form to another through various metabolic processes. So here we have an example of photosynthesis. Okay? We're very much familiar with it. Um, so in photosynthesis, um, plants okay, um, harness energy from the sun. Okay? by uh, capturing uh, carbon, carbon dioxide molecules from the atmosphere and water and minerals from the soil with uh, pigments such as chlorophyll. Okay, so that uh, solar energy is, is converted and all those raw materials are converted into food molecule in the form of uh, glucose with um, chemical formula C6H12O6. And they also give off carbon, uh, they also give off oxygen and water as byproduct. Okay? So they, they capture uh, plants uh, capture carbon uh, dioxide and then release oxygen as a byproduct of photosynthesis. Now, in terms of energy flow, the, ener the solar energy is now converted um, after photosynthesis into chemical energy. And when those plant leaves are eaten by um, um, animals, okay, in this case an elephant, by, um, uh, by an herbivore, okay, so the chemical energy is now um, being utilized by the animal's body. Okay, so the cells of the plant of the animals will perform, of course, cellular respiration to break down the food molecule and harvest the energy, adenosine triphosphate or ATP. Um, animals um, all now give off carbon dioxide as their byproduct, as well as water and um, heat. Okay, so um, eventually, you no know, animals after they eat fruits and trees also return uh, nutrients to the soil um, in the form of their waste and eventually when their body dies um, after being decomposed by decomposing bacteria and other saprotrophs eventually the material their, their physical bodies and their nutrients will be returned to the soil to be used by other plants um, growing around them okay so that's how cycling of nutrients are are participated in by um, animals and plants in an ecosystem. Number five, energy flow through an ecosystem. This was partially discussed now in the previous this previous theme, but um, I've mentioned this um, again. I'll mention this again that all living things are part of the uh, of a food chain or food web or even part of an energy pyramid. So that includes the flow of energy uh, from the sun. And then captured by the producers, plants, um, algae, uh, through the process of photosynthesis. And then when, when plants are eaten by the consumers, and the consumers are eaten by the next consumers, that energy is transferred to the next um, trophic level. And um, organisms give off heat as a byproduct of their metabolic processes. So all living things are part of, of energy flow. So sunlight processed by the plants, okay, then plants or, or plant body parts are eaten by animals, then the energy is transferred, and then those energy will allow the animals to perform uh, work or movement or other metabolic processes, and then they are eaten by other animals, so the energy is transferred until, until at the end of the um, food chain, food web. Okay? So all living things are part of energy flow through an ecosystem. Next theme, number six, structure correlates with function. So for biologists, we understand that there is a relationship between an organism's structure and how, it's, how it works or, or function. Okay? So there's this um, 
theme and uh, that we refer to as form fitting function so th if this is the purpose if this is the structure then this is its function perhaps if this is the structure it will tell us that this uh, piece this proboscis or this protrusion in the insect's face is for for example sipping nectar or sipping blood from its victims or from its um uh, yeah from its victim okay so biological structure uh, gives an idea on, on on what that body part does and how it works so that's why we have this whole field of study called anatomy and physiology wherein uh, you focus on the understanding of the structure the labels the name and then physiology the function of those body parts um, so structure determines function if the shape like that for, for, for example then possibly this is the purpose of that structure and the function is the object's specific role so examples of that proteins with different structures perform different functions within your cells heart muscles have a different shape compared to other muscle cells because this is their function and different species have different anatomical structures uh, from others because they have different functions um, so this is at molecular level this is at an organ level then this is at um, um, uh, evolution level so structure correlates with function is a very important theme this actually allows biologists to classify living things uh, based on their structure this allows us to identify unknown fossils or allows us to rebuild the a possible um, a possible um, form of an of an extinct species based on the fossil it leaves behind so um, again structure follows or correlates with function in living things next theme dna is the basis of inheritance all living things are capable of reproduction and all living things are capable of passing on their traits to their offspring and how they pass that off how they pass off that trait is through that molecule called dna which stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. So all forms of life, another important theme, all forms of life use the same genetic code, okay? So this is quite mind-blowing. All living things from bacteria to, to insects, to humans, to other plants and animals, to big sperm whale and big, big um, elephants and giraffes, all living things, we are all made up, uh, we all have, DNA as our um, um, as our genetic material, and we are we all have the same um, nucleot nucleotides or nucleic bases. So we all have adenosine, cytosine, uh, thymine, and guanine. So it's just that it's just that we have different configurations of this um, DNA molecules. Okay, so all our DNA are found in the nucleus of all our cells so all parts of our body all all our cells they contain our genetic material except for those cells um, that do not have a nucleus for example your red blood cells they are enucleated they do not have a nucleus so they do not have a dna so so when when so they do not have that okay but for the rest of your body your your body your cells all have your dna okay so this makes it easier for genetic engineers to actually um, uh, program the uh, DNA codes or swap or use gene therapy to correct um, genetic abnormalities in humans because this is where mostly this is where um, some chromosomal problems or some genetic problems are um, are, are found okay at your DNA um, molecules so if you can actually understand how our DNA works it could open a whole new um, field a whole new um, a whole new world to explore for us okay so this has already been mentioned now see all of the unifying themes are connected with each other so all living things are capable of reproduction they need to perform reproduction to pass on their genetic information to their offspring and uh, we have set, uh, we have two types of um, reproduction asexual reproduction wherein it the it only has one parent and most of the offspring are legitimate legitimate clones of the parent but we also have sexual reproduction which is more important another uh, uh, very important because sexual reproduction provides genetic diversity so we we see sexual reproduction as the union of gametes or egg cells or sperm cells so for example in humans um, half of your genetic material half of your genetic material uh, came from your mother 
So that's the egg cell of your mother. And then half of your genetic material came from your father through, through his sperm cell. So through the process of fertilization, the union of this egg cell and sperm cell becomes a zygote. And that zygote will undergo um, uh, multiple cell division uh, and, and, and grow into, uh, an, uh, into a baby, into a fetus, into a baby. And then it will grow into you, into an adult. So... Sexual reproduction is important because it provides genetic diversity. Okay, I always say this to my students. No two human beings have the same genetic materials, okay? Except for identical twins, okay? Because they were supposed to be just one individual, just one just one embryo that's split into two. But aside from that, aside from them, uh, no two no two organisms, no two human or individual have the same genetic material. So even if you and your siblings, even if you have the same parents, you are not clones of each other. You are not a clone of your sister or a clone of your brother, um, even if you have the same parent. Um, and that's an amazing thing because it means that your genetic combination will never happen again. Even if your parents are immortal and they could have millions and millions of babies, your genetic information, what that's what makes you you, okay? Uh, it will never happen again, okay? So you're unique. So no one like you has ever existed in the past. You're the only one who exists now. And I doubt no one could exist like you in the future because of sexual reproduction. The combination, the right sperm cell and that, that fertilized that particular egg cell, it could never happen again. And this is the reason why we have such genetic diversity. So even if you look at your... Uh, if you look, um, at your siblings, some of your siblings are tall, uh, is, uh, one of your siblings could be tall, one could be short, one could have curly hair, one could have um, bigger bigger eyes, one could have bigger ears, one could have smaller hands. So imagine the diversity or the differences within one family of the same parents. Imagine much more uh, much more diversity among among our uh, population. And, and this is also seen in our uh, in other animals and plants as well. So the more we, we have sexual reproduction, the more genetic diversity our population produces. So this is mostly seen in animals, plants, and fungi. So sexual reproduction is important because it provides genetic diversity. And genetic diversity is another thing that's important because the more diverse our genes are, the higher chances of um, our species survival. Okay, this one is actually an interesting field to talk about. Um, I hope you will have the time, we will have the time to, to learn about genetics and evolution. Okay. So. Next uh, unifying theme is regulation of biological processes. So biological processes are very important to ensure the survival of an organism. They are usually made up of chemical reactions on, or events that happen inside the organism's body that result in chemical transformation. So examples of those are metabolic uh, processes, okay, and homeostasis or processes to maintain homeostasis. So we see here an example of the control of body temperature by the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus is that part of your brain that is responsible for maintaining body temperature, um, uh, thirst, um, sleep cycles, blood pressure, and heart rate. So we see here two perturbing factors and let's look at how the body responds uh, uh, to it, okay, to those. So uh, for example, the perturbing factor would be the sun, of course, the organism is exposed to the sun. So the stimulus there, okay, that what triggers the reaction would be that the body temperature rises after uh, receiving solar energy or being exposed to the sun. Now, the body temperature, the rise in the body temperature will be detected by the thermoreceptors in the body. And then those uh, information will be brought to the integrating center of the brain, in this case, the hypothalamus. Then the hypothalamus, in order to, um, in order to address the rising body temperature, okay, will now um, release information, will now re release its command to the effectors so that the blood vessels will dilate okay, or will enlarge okay, to, to accommodate the flow of red blood cells and the glands will release sweat okay, from the skin. So those uh, two um, uh, events will now, will eventually um, cause the body temperature to fall. So after rising, 
the body temperature will now cool down, the temperature will fall, and everything will, re will return to a homeostatic state, okay, into normal, okay, as we say. So that's one path, okay, in terms of controlling temperature. Now, for example, the, the organism, uh, the body um, was exposed to um, perturbing factors such as snow and ice, okay, so that's cold, right? So now it will cause the body temperature to drop, the body the body uh, will be too cold, okay? Um, and that's not good, okay? Now that information, the stimulus will be detected by the thermoreceptors um, in, the, in the body and it, the information will be brought again to the in integrating center, the hypothalamus. Now this time, what the hypothalamus will command the body to do is for the blood vessels to constrict, okay? To constrict, okay? Um, and then the skeletal muscles uh, will contract, um, most probably the abdominal muscles uh, will contract and cause the muscles to shiver or the body to shiver. So um, those two events of blood vessels cons being constricted and um, contraction or shivering of the uh, skeletal muscles will cause, body for the, will cause the body temperature to rise. So to counter the drop, now the body temperature will rise and then it will be returned um, hopefully, you know, it will be ret the body will return to its normal temperature after some time. Okay, so this is an example of how regulation of biological processes uh, happen within an organism's body and how they ensure the survival of that organism. Last, um, evolution explains the unity and diversity of life. So one of the major um, concept in biology is the understanding that all organisms are are related and all of us can trace our ancestry to a single organism and so that makes that makes us um, relatives to each other okay so we are related to each other and we know that the driving force of these changes over time is evolution um, and so evolution is the change in living things overnight over time so we we use uh, we we see the concept of evolution um, as it tries to explain how all of us are connected to each other, how all of us can trace our lineage, our ancestry to to a common ancestor, and also evolution is the reason why we are such diversified um, in terms of species um, today. So diversity is explained by how organisms adapt to their varying habitats, while unity um, shares uh, explains to us how we are all descendants of a common ancestor. So examples, uh, uh, under evolution, we have several evidences of evolution. Um, at least that will be tackled in, the, in unit seven for grade 11 and then unit uh, 15 for grade eight. So, um, so we see um, evolution because there's a change in the genetic makeup of a population as a species change. Evolution can occur through different, different mechanisms. Examples of that would be natural selection, mutation, genetic drift, and then adaptations that organisms have are beneficial that, and that allows them to survive and pass on their traits to their next offspring. So for a classic example here <clears throat> of natural selection. So for example, these are the beetles and beetles, beetle population in a tree, for example. And we all know that um, according to um, theme number eight, sexual reproduction provides genetic diversity. So even if they belong to the same species, they have different colors or varying colors. Um, and those that are lighter in color tends to be easily seen by the predators, allowing them, to, uh, making them easy to spot and then making them um, food of their predators. Um, so they're the ones who get eaten right away so they don't have the chance to reproduce anymore so what remains are the darkly colored beetles over time if this keeps on happening over and over and over again there will come a time that the genes uh, that the organisms carrying the genes for uh, a white coloration will will eventually disappear from the gene pool so what remains would be the dark colored darkly colored beetles how will we know that um, they are now considered a new species or how will we know that they have evolved over time? If we introduce this group of darkly colored beetles with another group of light colored beetles and they do not interbreed anymore or they do not produce a fertile um, offspring anymore, then we can say that this group of dark colored beetles have already evolved 
and are now considered a new species. So, so biologists understand that this is how living things evolve. Um, through natural selection, this is one example, through genetic drift, through mutation, and all of those we will tackle um, as we go through this um, semester. Okay? Sige. So biology and society um, uh, is a very uh, has a very important connection with each other because, um, as we all know, majority of the developments in the field of biology has great application in society. So development of drugs allow us to cure diseases. Um, coming up with better environmental solutions um, allow allow our population to to consume to consume from the environment, but in in a reasonable and um, sustainable manner. So this allows us uh, more understanding of environmental issues allow people to have a better relationship with their environment. Uh, research on nervous system or an other bad body system um, helps in the improvement of the treatment of certain diseases and new findings in DNA, particularly in food production, allow us to feed the growing population. So these are all the relationships of biology with society, and this is the reason why we need more um, biology graduates. We need to have more STEM graduates because only then can we really go deeper into these um, applications and could help improve our society better. For your reflective journal log, I recommend that you watch this video uh, from Kurgizas, What is Life and Is Death Real? Hopefully, this could be this could be a, a little uncomfortable to watch because it will really shatter, shatter um, your understanding of the definition of living things, but I, I recommend that you watch this one. Um, so, I will provide the link in the description below. That ends our video. I hope you learned something new. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and like and share this video. Till next time, goodbye.